Game Music Festival. Jedyny festiwal poświęcony muzyce z gier. Dwa dni, dwa koncerty, światowa premiera muzyki z Baldur's Gate 3, a do tego Divinity Original Sin 2, Bastion, Transistor, Pyre, Hades, muzyka z legendarnych gier na żywo. Ponadto warsztaty i prelekcje prowadzone przez najlepszych kompozytorów i realizatorów dźwięku. Trzecia edycja Game Music Festival. 16 i 17 października w Narodowym Forum Muzyki we Wrocławiu. Wydarzenie będzie także transmitowane online. Więcej informacji na gmfest.com. Poleca Game Music Festival. So, hi, my name is Ryan Oliveira. I'm a Montreal-based composer. I've been doing music for video games for over a decade. Um, I started uh, quite a few years ago with a game called Pop On Yo, and um, I was given a chance to just do what I do as an artist within a game. And once I started getting into the journey, I really fell in love with, with all of everything about it, the full process, the, the, the open creativity that the game world has to, to being able to try new things and, and go to different directions. So yeah, we're going to go into a very quick journey into how I work, some of the processes. Um, as you can see here, we have a picture of uh, my studio where I work in Montreal. This is, uh, this is the, ma the magic room where I have over now 1,100 instruments. Um, the project that I'm going to focus on is, uh, is Tomb Raider. Oh, and we got a little sound here that's, that's playing through the, the presentation, so I guess it officially started. So. Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak a bit about the studio and how I work, and then we'll get into one of the projects that I did, uh, uh, specifically Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So I was, uh, as I was mentioning, um, some of the background, we've got, I've got this amazing space where it was actually the old RCA recording room. So it was built as a, to resonate as a musical instrument. And over the last few years, I've learned to play this, the room and the acoustics in that sense. It's changed completely the way that I make music. I actually don't use any sampled instruments. Um, I fully go 100% live. It's been a very decisive way of working and it's done wonders for me. It's, it's, it's been the fact that you can't really, you know, hide by, by MIDI sequencing and, and, and using, you know, machines to, to correct you has a huge effect on your creative process. And we'll get into that a bit further. So yeah, quickly on, my, on going through the presentation, we'll get into more of an introduction. We'll go into how I work with research, and this is my favorite part of it. Um, actually, all of it is my favorite, but this is definitely one of the most fun parts of it because I spend a lot of time thinking about how I'm going to execute it before I even get into the studio. Then we do the execution of the music and integration into the, into the game engines. And also, um, there's a performance aspect to it, and we'll, I'll show you how I've done it, at least within this game that we're going to focus on with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So yeah, talking about this game, um, the other two games that uh, previous versions of the trilogy were amazing. Jason's Graves uh, Trans Contract was one of my favorite. And when I was given the, 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 this game to work on, I really wanted to go very deep into what I could bring to the table because, you know, the sound had been already so, there was so much already done. And, and there was such great music that was already created. So I wanted to have my own take. My, and the nice thing is that we have um, a very dark and wild and, and you know, dark world that, that, that's, that has a, that's a, an inner journey of Lara. This game focused a lot on that. And when I met um, Rob Bridget, who was my other director, he became my partner in crime in this. He, he really was the other musician, the even though he was not playing the instruments, he, we really jammed along and, and he was the one guiding me. He was kind of like my, my spirit guide within the game. And together we, we created some, something pretty interesting. And that's one thing I have to say, when you work with audio directors, for the most part, they are your partners. You are, you are it's like having a band and you know, we're gonna work together and you're gonna make some amazing music and some, I mean, some great songs that might end up being hits over many more years. Um, so the nice thing about, about uh, Shadow was that I was given the, the idea that what if the Aztecs and Incas had not been decimated? What if their world had continued and their cultures had continued to evolve? What would the music sound like then? What, 
you know, what would happen. And the thing is that there's no real recordings of this. There's only pieces out there. And this is something that I had to spend a lot of time and I spent over almost four years actually continuously working on and researching. This to me was kind of like my own thesis, my own doctorate into, into creating music for a game. Uh, you'll see, we got really, really deep. Um, another thing too was the, the idea of, of creating these, these environments and the music that would be reminiscent and, and, and as real as possible in real settings, such as like the Day of the Dead in Mexico. Um, I love Mexico, I'm, I'm, Latin, I'm Latinx myself, so I really resonate with all of this. And, and I, you know, right away, I can almost like, you know, smell the, the food around when I see these images. And, and I really went nuts on, on these aspects as well. Um, and yeah, it's fun because the first thing that one, this is one of the first images that I was shown when I was told that, that they were interested in working with me in this project. And I had to come up with some, some uh, I guess, pieces to really start going deep into the, the idea of what would it be to be in, in the Peruvian Amazon with this culture, like as I mentioned before, but also the idea of her, within her point of view. And the biggest thing is the idea of fear. What is the sound of fear within her context, within her inner journey? This is something that, uh, that for me is fascinating, like, you know, really going deep into a character and trying to bring out the many layers of in, in a musical sense, because that's what music is. It is pure emotion. Sound vibration is emotion, and it's very powerful, especially in this context. So I'm gonna play you guys a clip. This was one of the first pieces I did. Um, this was in my old studio before I moved to the Victor studio. And I'd already started figuring out ways that I could really, you know, start using many more instruments. I had already been a multi-instrumentalist, but I, I really like broke the seal in this one and I just started going nuts. And I was lucky enough that I had uh, somebody that was around shooting this. So here's a little clip just to show you a bit of an example. The nice thing was that um, I would no real restrictions other than having very big picture goals in mind, you know, and, and that, was, that was a nice thing. I, had, I also had the luxury of time. I had just even doing this specific workshopping on fear it took many months and I tried many different pieces. And yeah, the, the big thing too, working with, with uh, Rob Bridget, my audio director, was that he really wanted to push the boundaries of what, you know, sound design and music are and how they work together and the ambiguity be between them and in a sense creating musical sound design. This is something that I'm really big on. So it was a, a great match and we really took a lot of time to just try to figure out ways that where, I, as you'll see in, in, in later examples, where I created musical elements that he would use in sound design and then also a lot of the sound design, the jungle, I would use as inspiration for some of the music so that I, you know, it would at certain points be chaotic and completely non-linear in certain times. And, you know, just to, just to go with the environment, with the gameplay and vice versa, he would be working with a lot of different elements. We'll get into this a bit more, but just wanted to touch base. And the other thing it, that was really 
a major lesson for me. And this doesn't, it hasn't just applied to this game, it's applied to many more of, of the projects that I've worked on now, is the idea that pre-Hispanic music, there was no concept of music as music per se. Music was sound that you created uh, for living life. This was part of daily life. This was part of rituals, part of worship, part of, of bringing the day, uh, you know, leaving the day, leaving the dead, being with your family, being, you know, doing, it was just a, a thing that you did. And so just getting to that state of mind where you're creating sound without thinking of musical scales, without thinking of, of musical structure in that sense, and just going with feeling really changed my, my way of approaching composing. And this happened over the, over the, over the, three years that I worked in, in a big way. And you'll see, I, you know, at first I was trying to really plan things out, even though I was doing different parts. And then as I started working with this further, and as, and as I started to explore this further, it had a huge effect on how I compose it. And this is how I work even to this day in, in a major way. Um, big thing that I did also was to go to Mexico and spend a couple of weeks uh, in person, just studying, traveling. I met some instrument makers. I also ended up going to the, the Instituto Nacional del Disco, which was the, the national repository of recordings and spent many, many hours just listening to anthropological recordings of different tribes of studies of how some of these instruments that they've dug up, how they sounded. I spent a lot of time with, with these people also that, that are recreating the instruments because there is a resurgence of pre-Hispanic music in Mexico and, and there's some really good experts in this nowadays. Um, regrettably, actually, one of the main ones I learned from, he recently died, but um, the legacy continues and it continues in the music. Uh, and here, I'll just play you a couple clips of some of the, the little studies that I heard. This is just one, one quick clip here. Yeah, yeah, just actually, I'm going to go back to this, to this clip again. Um, what happened at the end of my journey was that I ended up with like, literally, like, as you see in the last picture there, more than eight filled suitcases. People were just asking, what is that, instruments? And I'm like, yeah, I'm making music for a video game. They're like, you're doing a video game with these instruments? Look at me as if I was crazy. But hey, you know, it's... Uh, it, you will see the results. But the nice thing too that was that people were so friendly and they were so helpful. Um, you know, at a certain point, uh, one of the clips there, I, I, where you see on the left, where, where you see like the pieces of clay, I ended up in this little town where they only specialize in making these instruments. And, you know, when they heard that I was doing this, this kind of, of project, they all opened up their doors and, and were really welcoming and, and sharing their knowledge. So this is something that I encourage everybody um, to do. If you're working on music, really try to go deep, try to bring cultural influences from different places and really, you know, live the world and, and, and bring it in. Don't just try to just make up something. Um, I mean, it's fine to be closed up. We're, we're in an age where things are, we're very isolated, but whenever you can, no matter what, you should try to always just have, you know, either live experiences or, and or cultures have bring a bit of richness to to the to the music that you're creating that's just like the most fun for me and eating the food also so i'll actually shift here to one of the clips where some of the instruments that i grabbed here's the one of the perfect ones it's it's called a acid a, a tempo nasty and i'll just let the clip play Yeah, 
at, at a certain point I was in this village and I found this old man that had these stones and I just went crazy. I was like, I have to get these. And I had a helper with me and, you know, I'm in this town in the middle of nowhere, hours from getting back to the city. <laughs> I had to take like three different taxis and a bus and I put this in, in a bunch of bags and I was, you know, I had my helper helping me and, and, and she's going like, beaches, I was like, these damn stones, what the hell? And we're just like dragging this stuff all around. So much fun. Um, the other thing that I did when I came back from that trip um, was to actually try to put this into a real performance environment to just really feel it out. And I was lucky enough that one of the, one of the main musicians that I met ended up coming back with me. I, I actually flew him right after I, I came back from Mexico. And we did an artist residency, which was at, at this dome in Montreal at the time. And nobody knew, but I was making music for Tomb Raider and rehearsing it there. But it was a 360 dome and I got to create this shamanic ritualistic experience and i'll just play a quick little preview clip <laughs> I spent a month workshopping this. I spent another month, four days a week, um, actually performing this ev almost every day. It was four to five days a week. So it just, you know, doing this live with a crowd, figuring out how people react, and also, you know, playing with these master musicians around me, especially Ramiro, who is the, the master uh, from, from Mexico. It just, you know, it all just became fluid. And the process from there onwards became very interesting. Um, I'm going to show you a couple more of the sad performances just to give you a little bit more of, a, of an idea of, you know, how we took it, how far we took it within this context. These are the same stones where, yeah, I had people swearing me, but hey. Yeah, after all that time, it was at that specific part of the production, I, it was time to start creating the music within the game, the, the, the inner world music, what, you know, this, this whole time of that I'd spent thinking, what would they, how would they make this music? So here's a little clip of, of in world music that was recorded around the same time, actually pretty much right after. Mal y Betty. Taruca Minano City.
Yeah, and as you can tell uh, with Rob, um, it's really nice because him, he, him and the team, he was able to take all the different elements and place them within the game in really far places. So, you know, wherever you're turning, where you, wherever you're going in this world, you could tell that, you know, there were these horns going off in the mountains off here and different things going on there. Really, really fun stuff. And yeah, part of it was, it just was just so fluid to do because I had spent so much time immersing myself in this music and going deeper into, into what we could do with this. <laughs> um, I'll show you guys another quick example also the, the, with the idea of doing things live on the spot. And this is something that's changed you know, ever since. I, when I score now, I just look at the picture and to be honest, I don't even have to think too much. I just go with the feeling and I do it live just to, live to the picture. And I'll do the music from the very beginning to the very end, one take. Uh, usually barely any retakes, if any. I tr it's almost like a sport for me now because I try to do this all in one go. And then I'm doing like sometimes even hundreds of tracks. But this is a, a little clip of, of me and Ramiro, my, my, my friend from Mexico, the, the Prismatic Master, doing something live to score with, uh, with Rob in the studio as well. Scene that we were scoring to was actually the first uh, scene that you saw me doing all of this multi instrumental, uh, multi clip uh, at the beginning of the presentation. But we ended up using this these live takes as the music for that. So it's a it's a good example of how things progress from you know severe planning, a lot of multi language to actually going minimalist and live on the spot. Um, yeah, really interesting what happens when you when you really start going deeper into into creation. It's sometimes less is more. Um, I'm also going to show you a quick clip um, here of, of, you know, what I did, what I had started in the, in the beginning did continue. So it wasn't just purely live. It was severe, you know, a lot of multi-tracking, but I did kind of take it a little bit to a higher level. And you guys will see with this little clip, it should be able to play. Here we go.
seriousness when you're making these faces when you're performing. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, seriously. Um, yeah, and very quickly, I'll just go through some of the sessions. So as you can see here, this is a, we had to like do multi windows, but this is just like a smaller session and of all live takes. This is kind of like how I like to work uh, with when I'm doing this and I just go next, 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 next. There's so much track, there's so much material to do. I had to literally do hundreds of minutes of music within the last few months of the production that there was no time for hesitation. Um, and um, actually, this I just wanted to play you quickly, just to, you know, for those of you that are interested in how I work, break down some stuff. It's always changing in terms of stems, but and and working with interactive music, there's so many things you can do. But we we kind of simplified it to a certain extent with uh, with shadow. And uh, yeah, here's a some a couple quick clips of of some of the elements in terms of like the stem breakdown. Here we go with a bit of low percussion. And Rob would dynamically mix all of these. So him and the team, they would set up an interactive music system and just really go crazy with this. And things would be just coming up and down, changing different sections. We could be going in and out. But everything was, when I composed it, I would stack it and make sure that everything could work with each other seamlessly, no matter what. So yeah, even lots of tension strings. Even other strings. And lots of, you know, of course, lots of like string bass. I love that bass. Best 300 bucks I've spent on a used bass. <laughs> Seriously. And of course, the death whistles. This is, you know, the signature sound. Just a bit of which is where it gets super interesting too you know this is where I'll, I'll quickly touch base on this is using these non-musical instruments as that sort of ambiguous bridge between what is real and what is not what's music and what is sound effect um, so yeah I'll actually play you some quick clips here this is uh, some of these death whistles and conch shells actually here's more conch shells placed in a 3D environment in a musical and sound effect sense Shells you hear all these little things. So the nice thing is you feel like it's coming from the world. It's someone that's you. Maybe, maybe it's in her head. Maybe it's both. And I'll skip through a couple of quick things since we're in a in a time limit, but. Yeah, I'll play one of the other clips. Um, these are the more the breaths, and, and this one I was using a bit of sound of death whistles, but actually I ended up using a lot more just my, my own breaths. Oh, that gives you guys the idea. Um, yeah, and the nice thing with, with at, least with, at least with Shadow, was that we were really able to expand that zone of ambiguous sound and, in a sense, create something that, you know, was really immersive and, and didn't feel like, you know, it was just music or just sound effects and would just be something in between that would just give you feeling and, and be true to even the culture uh, that we were, some of the cultures that, that we were portraying there. Uh, without it, you know, without actually like culturally appropriating it, because we really did take the time to go deep as, as we, we've seen here. Um, so yeah, some of the takeaways for, for this presentation, the biggest thing, you know, when you're creating 
music and sound, um, yeah, a strong identity and tone is, is very important. Uh, yeah, try to really take the time to do the research, have some, have some real, you know, roots and, and foundations and, and depth to how you're creating uh, and how you're going to go about making music. Um, I know it's a given, but, you know, get, putting the time into this does make a difference, not just for what you're doing it, but also for yourself as a creator. It will make you grow as a person. It, it definitely has that, done that for me in a big way. Um, and yes, the sounds of the instruments influences the sound design in, in a big way too. And for, for me, I would say that the sounds of the instruments influence your music, you know, the way you create in a very big way. So, you know, if that's why I, I take the time to always find new instruments. I'm always, uh, you know, even in this room, I just ended up buying instruments. I'm like, a, I'm a bit of an addict, actually. You know, I, I keep building this, the collection and, you know, got 1,100, maybe in a couple of years, so I might get to 2,000. We'll see. But the fact that you can use these instruments and physically play them, there's something special uh, of that transference of, of energy and, and, you know, of the performance of it that's magical that you can't quite get with virtual instruments that easily, I would say. Um, and yeah, the, the, the concept that, that sound and music are one in, in pre-Columbian culture, um, that again is, I, I keep saying, bringing it up, but it's something that I think can be applied to not just this context, but just music making and sound creation and music creation within games, because it's such an immersive medium. And yeah, the use of ambiguous sound to create emotional effect, you know, we're not just going to go playing, you know, minor scale or major scale. Hey, we're sad, we're happy. No, what is that in between? What is that environment? How do we feel inside? Because emotions are very complex. We are complex beings. The world is a complex being, so, environment. So how can we put this together in such a way that, it, that it's going to be, you know, immersive and feel good also and not just be just, you know, shove down your throat also. <laughs> and yeah, the, the idea that, that the score is integrated into, into gameplay. If, if, you, if, you, if you can take some of these lessons away, I, I'd, be, I'd be hopeful that you, all of you can create something that's a bit more you know, integrated and, and going deeper in, into what could be the possibilities. And, and at the end of the day, you just want to have fun. I mean, I'm talking a lot. Um, this is just one way of the, of the process, but there's many ways to, to the same path. So, I mean, there's many paths to the same goal. So this is just, you know, food for thought for, for all of you here. Um, yeah, and I'm going to just skip through here. So, yes, this is the end of my presentation. If you guys have any questions, please do feel free to contact me, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you.